Welcome, Jed. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Liz. Thanks so much. It's uh, wonderful to be with you this evening. Thank you for this invitation. Um, and thank you to uh, Joe and Susan Barbuto as well for making this connection. They uh, have been uh, members of the church in Larchmont where I had been a pastor some years ago, and, and that's how that connection happened. And now here we are in Ridgewood, New Jersey, which is not too disconnected from me either. I've got a uh, family in New Jersey, Maplewood, Metuchen, and uh, another sister over in Manhattan. Uh, one of my sisters, I think, is, is with us tonight. So um, whenever I do get back to the U.S., I'm usually in your neck of the woods. So uh, if there's anything you hear tonight that interests you and you want to learn more about, perhaps we can even connect over coffee one day. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Here we go. I think I'm doing this. And I'm going to start my slideshow. Uh, this evening, I want to look at wellness from a, perhaps a different perspective um, than um, some of uh, what you may have been hearing over the, the past season. Uh, I want to look at wellness uh, in relation to uh, the earth. Uh, and if the, the fundamental message behind this being that um, our well-being as humans is intimately and directly connected to the well-being of the earth. Um, and this is a, uh, a, a question, uh, a movement, a spirituality that uh, we are addressing. I say we, uh, myself and our partners here in Peru, um, through a program that is called Joining Hands. This is a program of the Presbyterian Church USA, um, but it is very ecumenical and interfaith. Um, so we are certainly not exclusive to Presbyterians. Uh, joining Hands for God's Creation and a movement of uh, creating global solidarity in the care for what we call our common home, which is uh, for any Catholics among uh, who might be among with us this evening, that's the term that Pope Francis often uses for, uh, for creation, our common home. So I'm gonna speak a bit to uh, our movement for solidarity and caring for our common home this evening. Uh, everything Liz said uh, about me was true. <laughs> um, I also want to uh, mention my wife, uh, Jenny Baez. Uh, she's not going, you're not going to see her this evening. You may hear her or you most likely you'll hear our son, Tiago. Uh, this photo is probably a couple years old. He's now four years old. So um, we live here in, uh, in Lima where I'm uh, speaking from this evening. Um, she is also a mission coworker. Uh, a mission coworker is um, a more modern term for missionary. We don't really use the word missionary anymore. Uh, mission coworker is to is uh, to suggest that we work alongside partners in the world. So we don't just go into the world wherever wherever we want, wherever we we feel uh, we think God needs us. It's where we're invited to. Um, so I've been invited here to Peru, and I happened to meet my wife, Jenny, here in Peru, uh, and together we are mission co-workers for the Presbyterian Church. Her particular role is as a coordinator of a volunteer program for 20-something-year-olds in the U.S. who come to Peru for a year. Um, and this past year, it's been an off year <laughs> because of the pandemic, uh, but soon we're hoping to receive volunteers uh, once again. Um, and then my particular role is as a facilitator of partnerships uh, between our partner here, uh, which uh, Liz uh, mentioned, the Red Unindo Manos Peru, um, and uh, churches in the U.S., predominantly Presbyterian, but again, uh, we work with uh, also a, a wide variety of churches, but also universities and, and any other civic or uh, civil society group in the U.S. Um, I, beyond being a pastor, beyond being mission co-worker. I am a very, very, very amateur video editor. Uh, and I say that because I'm about to present a video. Uh, and my style of uh, video editing, uh, video making, I like to call a democratic video uh, production. Uh, it's what I like to do is to take video images that others have filmed using the most simple and basic technology, probably off their cell phone, uh, and collect them and tie them together uh, in a single narrative, uh, that kind of a shared narrative. Um, and so I'm going to show a video right now, uh, which uh, I, I made um, for the uh, Presbyterian Hunger Program's Joining Hands Initiative as an introduction to the program that I'm going to speak more about this evening.
y va, sigue contaminando, quemando, quemando. O sea, que esto ya no tiene remedio, ¿no? O sea, aquí ya no podemos ni sembrar. Nosotros creemos que las personas como nosotros vamos a impulsar un proceso de cambio. Este día es importante para resaltar la necesidad de establecer una serie de políticas. La voz de las mujeres, la voz de las indígenas que tiene que ser escuchada. When I uh, arrived to Peru about 12 years ago now, um, I was invited up to a community high up in the mountains, the central Andes, uh, to a place called Juan Cavalica. And um, I had with me uh, the promise of a grant from a church in the US uh, that wanted to help a community in need. And so I went to visit a community this, in Juan Cavalica. And um, the person who I met was a woman named Angelica. And Angelica uh, explained to me the issues that in this rural uh, community was having, uh, saying that the, the pastures where their alpaca were feeding um, were dying uh, because they didn't have adequate water for the pastures. And uh, she said, you know, they needed a irrigation system um, that would help. Uh, and so I had this grant and said, okay, well, uh, we can finance this irrigation system. Um, I said, I'll come back in a month. Uh, and kind of see the progress. So a month passes and uh, I go back to this community and to get to this community, it's literally, you're taking a bus about 12 or 13 hours up into the Andes mountains. Uh, and I mean, it's just windy roads. You're going up above 16,000 feet and you kind of settle down into about 12,000 feet. 
uh, it is no easy trip to get there. And, but I come back and I've got, you know, a, my video camera in one hand, you know, and a, a regular camera in the other. I'm ready to document all the progress. And I arrive uh, to the community and I see they had done absolutely nothing. Uh, and so I was devastated and I was embarrassed. I didn't know what I was going to tell the church back in the U.S., you know, that nothing had happened with their money. There was nothing to report on. And Angelica says to me, listen, come with me. We're going to go to a Pachamanca. I had no idea what she was talking about. Uh, so I just followed her and we started walking higher and higher and we get up to the top of a hill and there is uh, the community and they're all kind of sitting around on top of this hill. And in the middle, they have this pile of rocks. It's um, almost like an igloo. Uh, and inside of it, there's a fire that's burning really strong. And uh, next to it, there's a big hole in the ground. And they start putting these hot rocks into this hole in the ground. And then uh, bit by bit, they um, are filling it up with these hot rocks and coals. And then they put pieces of meat on the rocks, uh, chicken and alpaca meat. Uh, and then they start covering it with wet leaves and they put in more rocks and put in potatoes and you know, filling it all up with different kinds of food and layers of rocks and then they bury it uh, under dirt. Uh, a pachamanca uh, is a, a feast, a Thanksgiving feast. Pacha uh, means earth in Quechua and manca means pot. Uh, so a pot in the earth. And so we're sitting there uh, waiting for it to cook, uh, just sitting around, hanging out, when in the distance, uh, I see some rain clouds approaching. And I say, you know, Angelica, I think it's going to rain. And she says, no, don't worry, Jed, it's fine. We're totally fine up here. You know, a few minutes pass, and I hear some thunder rolling in the distance. I say, you know, Angelica, seriously, I think it's going to rain. You know, what are we going to do? And she says, we're going to be fine. Don't worry about it. Well, a couple more minutes pass and there's a flash of lightning, the thunder cracks and the rain starts pouring down on top of us. And Angelica turns to me and says, Jed, I think it's gonna rain. And so we start running off. Uh, the entire community gets up running, leaving our Pachamanca behind. Uh, and there was a shelter nearby actually for the alpaca. And so we're all gathered in underneath this, uh, this makeshift shelter. We look like a living nativity scene in the middle of the Andes mountains. We just didn't have a baby there before us, uh, but Angelica did deliver some truth to me in that moment. She said, Jed, here's the thing about this grant and this irrigation system. Um, when you look around here, when you look to the north or to the east and you see those mountain peaks, those once used to have snow caps on top of them, but all those snow caps are melting. That's the source of our water, but global warming has, is uh, drying up our, our water source. And if you look to the north of us, there's a river that flows down here. That river is completely contaminated uh, because of mining practices. So we can't use that water for our alpaca. And if you look to the south of us, there's a lagoon down there. And that lagoon is being siphoned off and sent to the desert down below on the coast to irrigate big farms on the coast. And so our alpaca don't have access to that water. So yes, we need an irrigation system. And yes, it will help us a little, but if you seriously want to address the issues that are that we are facing, you have to take on these big issues all around. We need you to walk with us and address climate change, mining practices, and so many other industries out there that do not live in harmony with this earth around us, because this is our life. Our spirit is tied up in these mountains. And so we need you to be in solidarity with our spirit and to, uh, to become an to fall in love with these mountains around us. Peru has massive mountains, the Andes Mountains. Uh, and it is a very diverse place from the desert coast below to the mountains, Andes Mountains running through it and the Amazon jungle on the other side. Um, it is of course located on, in South America on the Pacific coast, a population of about 32 million of which a third of it lives right here in Lima. So a third of the entire country is right here in this one big city, right in the middle of the desert on the coast. Um, it's called a mega city because we've got more than 10 million people here. Uh, we mostly speak Spanish, but Quechua and Aymara are also official languages, indigenous languages, because the population in Peru is predominantly indigenous. 25% uh, identify ethnically as indigenous, 
but well over 90% have um, indigenous uh, ancestry. Um, about 5% of the population identifies as African Peruvian um, because of their ancestors or because they're descendants of Africans who were enslaved and brought here through the slave trade. Uh, and there's also a, a large Chinese and Japanese population, particularly here in Lima, but throughout the country. Uh, but here in Lima, the entire world is represented here. Uh, it's predominantly Catholic country, um, but a significant portion identifies as what they would call evangelical, which uh, is a, the term for Protestant by and large here and in much of Latin America. Uh, but many indigenous spiritualities are still practiced um, in indigenous communities, but they also surface throughout uh, expressions of Christianity here in Peru. Um, and it is a mega diverse country. And this I can't stress enough. Uh, in the world, there is something like a hundred and something different types of ecosystems. Over 80 of them you can find right here in Peru alone, from the desert to the snow caps, you know, to the Amazon jungle and everything in between. And it's all in a very small concentrated place. And so here one can see the interconnectedness of ecosystems and, um, and how we are dependent on them. Uh, and so spirituality um, dating back hundreds and thousands of years uh, is very much tied to our relationship with the earth. And so that is still very much a driving spiritual force here in Peru, our relationship with the earth. Um, as I was noting earlier, I didn't come here alone. Um, I didn't just come here on my own initiative. It wasn't the Presbyterian Church who said, Jed, go to Peru. Uh, we have partners here. Um, and our partner is a network, uh, Red Unindo Manos. It's autonomous. It's not Presbyterian. It's not a tie to, to any church. Uh, it's its own entity. It's ecumenical. Uh, and is very engaged in interfaith work as well. And it's made up of both churches and NGOs, non-government organizations or not-for-profits. Um, and it has a spirituality that uh, they would call ecocentric. Uh, again, referring to that relationship with the earth. Uh, and it's creating harmony. Um, so as opposed to a lot um, other spiritualities, more uh, uh, anthrocentric spiritualities, which are more focused on the development of the human, development of hum communities and prosperity. Uh, Ecocentric spirituality is really uh, about creating harmony and balance uh, among people, but also in relationship with the earth. Um, and its mission, the mission of our partner here is to advocate, um, to uh, speak out on behalf of marginalized peoples uh, and the earth. As a network, uh, they decided to begin their, their work, their mission um, in one particular place, one particular case, uh, which is what a lot of what I'm gonna speak to tonight is going to focus on. And this is called the town, uh, this is the case of La Oroya, Peru. Uh, it's located in the central Andes, uh, about five hours due east of Lima, uh, at about 12,000 feet above sea level. And it is one of the 10 most contaminated places in the entire world. Uh, at one point, it was considered the second most contaminated place behind Chernobyl. Um, the cause of contamination here is a, a metal smelter, and you see one of the chimney stacks here. Uh, and it would spew out uh, 2 million pounds of sulfur dioxide and other contaminants into the air every single day. And so we know that in La Roya, because of tests we've done, that 90, uh, nearly 99% of the children in this town have extreme levels of lead in their blood on top of arsenic, cadmium, um, and mercury. This is where there is absolutely no harmony with earth and a people who are in, uh, intimately uh, in, uh, impacted by this contamination. Um, and so what I'm gonna speak to how we've been addressing this. Um, now, we've been working on this for 20 years. <laughs> That's a long time. And so after 20 years, one might begin to ask, so what difference have you made? Uh, what has changed over the last 20 years of working in this particular town with this population and in this environment? And our partners will be the first to say, listen, before you ask you know, and be about what we, difference we've made or what changes we've seen over the last 20 years, first, you've got to ask, what has not changed over the last 500 years in Peru 
because once we begin to identify that, then we can see where the problem is. So let's go back in time, 500 years. Uh, King Ferdinand of Spain, uh, he had his kingdom, uh, his empire, uh, he wanted to expand it and defend it. And he said to his conquistadores, uh, get gold, humanely if possible, but at all costs, get gold. And so 1532, Francisco Pizarro, uh, the famous uh, conquistador, uh, particularly in South America, uh, he arrives uh, to what is today Peru. And he, with a small band of 20, uh, less than 200 uh, soldiers, um, ride, uh, ride up into the Andes Mountains uh, to a place called Cajamarca. Um, and he wants to meet the Inca. Uh, Inca is a Quechua word for the emperor. He's the head of the Quechua people. Uh, and his name was Atahualpa. This is 1532. And the legend goes, um, they meet in the center of the community uh, to greet one another. And uh, Pisaro has a priest with him and he hands to Atahualpa a Bible. Well, the Incas didn't have a written language. Uh, and so it's possible he'd never seen a book before in his life. So le legend says Atahualpa takes the Bible and he smells it, he feels it. Some say he even tasted it. He didn't know what it was. And so he put it on the ground. But in exchange, he offered to uh, Pisado a cup of chicha. Uh, chicha is a corn-based drink. And again, legend goes, uh, Pisado took a sip of the drink. He had never tried it before, didn't like it, spits it out, throws it on the ground. And there end the niceties. <laughs> and shortly thereafter, uh, Pisado has Atahualpa detained. And so Atahualpa offers as ransom for his release, a room full of gold. Well, gold was precisely why Pisado was there. And he takes the gold and shortly thereafter has Atahualpa executed. And thus begins 300 years of Spanish occupation in what is today Peru and all of South America, and most of South America. There were three kind of driving forces of Spanish colonization. Um, and European colonization in general, uh, they, it's, uh, it's often referred to as the three Gs of colonization, whether it was in the, the Americas, in Africa, or other parts of the world. Uh, gold, God, and glory. These three kind of driving forces, gold being uh, what we say today, extractivism or the extractive industry, where you see the earth as an object of wealth. So you dig into the dirt, you extract whatever you can out of it that will create wealth. Well, in that time it was gold. Uh, today, it might be oil, but it's still gold. Gold still has a lot of, uh, generates a lot of wealth today. Extractivism, uh, gold. The other was a uh, spiritual suppression. Um, and this is driven by the doctrines of discovery. In the 15th century, there's papal de uh, decrees uh, claiming anyone who's not Christian is pagan uh, and that you can go take their land and convert them to Christianity. Uh, and these doctrines of discovery were, have been influential up until this century uh, and, and even in U.S. law. Um, but the doctrines of discovery... Uh, imposing the church upon the people, and they literally built churches on top of Incan spaces of worship to physically suppress um, their spirituality. And then there was um, glory, uh, but glory is as much about domination. Uh, Spanish empire was in competition with other empires of the world, uh, and so they were expanding uh, as fast and as much, as much as they could to show that they were dominating the world. Well, with this domination, um, spirit of domination comes a spirit of uh, hierarchy. Uh, and so uh, the Spanish uh, colonization, in, particularly here in Peru, created a caste system. Uh, and these are the seeds of a white supremacy ideology, where at the very top of the pyramid uh, are the top of a hierarchy are people of what they would have referred to as pure blood, pure blood Spanish. Um, and at the very bottom uh, would be people of indigenous descent or Africans who had been enslaved. Um, and so there you have a hierarchy. 
fast forward 500 years now. Uh, what has changed? Uh, well, we can see Lima has grown a lot. Lima was the capital of um, the empire. Um, and it, um, excuse me, uh, was the, the capital of Spanish uh, kingdom. And uh, today it's the capital of Peru. And so the gold that was being brought, you know, 500 years ago would go through Lima and then out to the world to this very day, it comes to Lima. And Lima is a this big city. It's got, we've got billionaires, we've got yacht clubs, we've got, uh, you know, huge buildings and construction nonstop. There is a lot of wealth here in, in Lima. Uh, but a lot more wealth that then leaves Lima and goes around the world. Uh, that has, uh, uh, the city has grown, that has changed, but in general, the method has not changed. Uh, and in particular, what you see is uh, outside of Lima, there is still conflict between the people, indigenous who live there, and those who are trying to access their land to extract the gold or silver or what other, what other resource they find valuable there. Peru uh, today is a leading country in mining. Um, it ranks for, uh, sixth in gold production in the world, second in silver, copper, zinc. It is the driving force of the economy, particularly over the last 20, uh, 25, 20, 25 years. And you can see that here in the uh, exports um, uh, that have driven this economy. It's, they account for over two thirds of exports uh, in terms of dollars are, are from the mining sector. Um, and that's a president, sorry, I want to just note the, the, the quote from the president uh, up there. That's from uh, two, 2015, six years ago. That's also six presidents ago. Uh, we have, in the last year alone, well, this week, we elected what will be our fourth president since the start of the pandemic. Uh, we have an incredibly unstable uh, uh, state here. Uh, and I would say there's something intentional about that. Um, and it is Peru has been the darling of the world for the last 20 years, um, because uh, even with the 2008 recession, its economy took a little hit at the time, but it recovered really quickly. Um, and up until the pandemic, where it, it plummeted, uh, and I'll speak a little more to that later as well. But this has not been without a cost. Um, I'm going to show you a series of maps here uh, that indicate what's happening with mining here in Peru. This is a map of Peru, uh, its headwaters. Uh, you can see the, the, the green, that's the Andes Mountains, and that's where water originates, where the snow caps are. Um, and this is water for people on the coast, like here in Lima, and a lot of the water then goes into the Amazon jungle. These are, this is a map of mining concessions. This is land that has been conceded uh, to mining companies, uh, both Peruvian, but many of them um, international mining companies. So six, this is now it's close to 20% of land has been conceded to uh, mining companies for exploration and um, yeah, for mining activity. This does not include land, uh, immense amounts of land in the Amazon jungle that have been conceded for oil exploration. This is a map of mining liabilities. Um, La Roya, the most one of the most contaminated places in the world, that is one mining liability. There are over well over four thousand mining liabilities throughout the Andes Mountains um, that are putting at risk the lives of a third of the population. Eleven million people are at risk of um, po being poisoned from uh, the mining uh, contaminants in the soil um, and water due to mining activity. This is a map, a pre-pandemic map of um, poverty levels uh, that are above 50%. Uh, poverty has uh, spiked enormously uh, and during this pandemic, but uh, you can see where the primary levels of, um, the highest levels of poverty are through that same stretch. And then this last one, social conflicts. Uh, the red areas being where there are the most social conflicts and most intense social conflicts. By social conflict, I mean when a community is either at odds with another community, but more likely it's where it's in conflict with authorities or a company. There are over 200 social conflicts uh, uh, right now ongoing in Peru, and over half of those are directly related to the mining industry. So it's communities who are at odds with mining activity. So in this very same place where all the headwaters are that people depend on for their life and livelihood, 
is also where mining activity is happening, where mining activity is poisoning the land, where people are already impoverished and are not benefiting from that mining activity. And so now we have uh, conflict. And this is precisely what drove our most recent president, presidential election. Uh, if you have questions about I can talk about that in another moment. But so this is about two worlds colliding, two different ways of imagining the world. I'll translate this cartoon. Uh, these a group of indigenous peoples who saying, you know, for us, development is about solidarity and it's about equality and it's about maintaining balance and harmony with our, the natural world around us. Then you see this guy uh, on top of the front end loader, a little more European looking. And he says, you ignorant people, <laughs> development is about getting oil and it's about tearing down the forest and produce to, so we can produce ethanol. Um, this was very much, uh, uh, this is uh, two very, very distinct uh, ways of looking at the world. Uh, and these two very distinct worldviews come into uh, uh, direct conflict with one another. Uh, this is an incident that took place uh, shortly after I arrived here some years ago. Uh, it's known, this event is known as the Tiananmen Square, the Tiananmen of the Amazon, where there were some indigenous populations who had shut down a highway uh, because a trade agreement between the U.S. and Peru had recently been passed. And this trade agreement was going to open doors to access into the Amazon for more uh, uh, oil exploration. And so the indigenous peoples did not want to open the doors to their backyard. And so they shut down the highway. Um, the president at that time um, went on national television and he spoke to this ongoing con uh, conflict, you know, this, the stoppage in the highway. And he tells a story called El Pedro del Hortelano. Uh, it's a fable in which there was a man who owned a garden. And this man uh, had two dogs to protect his garden so that passersby wouldn't go in and steal his fruits and vegetables. Well, one day the man dies. Well, the two dogs continue to guard this uh, garden, uh, not allowing anyone to go in. And on national television, the president says, the indigenous peoples in the jungle are the dogs. Uh, and they're not letting us into our garden, uh, which is the Amazon, so that we can enjoy its fruits and vegetables, which for him meant uh, oil and other resources. This is the narrative that's driving uh, uh, investment in Peru today, and it's uh, impacting uh, indigenous people's lives uh, in particular. So what has changed? Back to the question. Um, some might say during the time of Spanish colonialism, it was those who extracted the resources, who dug out the gold, who served the state, or in this case, the empire, the kingdom of Spain. But in this era today, it is more about the state that appears to uh, serve the interests of the mining companies or the extractive industry. Um, it's just a different dynamic. But at the end of the day, not a whole lot has changed. Land is still being misappropriated. Ecosystems are still being destroyed and indigenous peoples are still being oppressed. The global pandemic has just brought this to light, uh, these inequities uh, even more so. Today, Peru has the highest fatality rate from COVID-19 in the entire world. Um, we've also had one of the highest contractions of the, of the economy in the past year, uh, about 11% contraction. And the response uh, has been, well, we need to double down on the mining industry because that's what generates, that's what grows the economy here. So there's been environmental ro uh, rollbacks of uh, environmental protections. And there's been a fast track approval of new mining projects. And there's been the assassination of uh, at least five uh, indigenous leaders, environmental activists this past year alone, folks trying to defend their land. So the question then comes to us, those of us who are part of the church, I'm speaking from the church. So uh, um, what about us in the midst of this? Uh, the church was very much present there 500 years ago, standing alongside Pisado when it handed out the WAP of that Bible. Where are we today? Uh, are we gonna be complicit in the continued conquest or are we gonna be collaborators in something new? Um, so I wanna look at rethinking mission, um, that I put that word in quotes. Um, because um, it's a tricky word. Uh, mission sometimes kind of has this uh, connotation of uh, objectifying others um, so that they are our agenda. We're going there to do something for them to solve their problems. 
And so we don't really think about it in the same way. Uh, we wanna talk more about growing solidarity um, on a global scale. And we're gonna look at it from this case of La Roya. Again, La Roya, one of the 10 most contaminated places in the world. Uh, we've done the health studies showing that 98% uh, of the children ages six to 12 have severe levels of lead in their blood. Um, over a thousand square miles of lands contaminated up to four inches deep. This used to be uh, farming land um, and now nothing can grow there. Uh, the source of contamination, this uh, a metal smelter, it was owned by a billionaire from New York, uh, New York City. Um, and at the height of production, emitting you know, millions of pounds of lead, arsenic, cadmium, sulfur dioxide every single day into the environment, landing upon you know, these children and their families. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Despite not complying with environmental standards, um, this billionaire, uh, he eventually, the, uh, because of our partners advocating you know, for the enforcement of these environmental regulations, he finally claimed uh, that the, the state does shut him down and he claims bankruptcy, uh, declares bankruptcy. And he then sues the government of Peru for hundreds of millions of dollars uh, saying that their enforcement of the environmental regulations violated his rights as a foreign investor, uh, because that's what it says in the trade agreement. Uh, it gives certain rights to foreign investors that to um, get a profit that they anticipate. And so he was not anticipating uh, the cost of these environmental regulations, therefore uh, his rights are being violated. This case is still uh, unsettled. Um, but this very same owner, and this is where it got really interesting for some of us, uh, particularly from the US, he also owned a smelter uh, outside of St. Louis, Missouri that was doing the exact same thing uh, in a town called Herculaneum. Uh, and that uh, smelter with uh, some work of our collaboration uh, was also shut down by the EPA uh, just a few years ago. And again, La Roya, this is just one of over uh, 4,000 mining liabilities throughout the Andes Mountains in Peru. So how are we responding? Um, our partner, Red Uni Nomanos Peru, we respond, we think about very locally in La Roya, nationally throughout Peru, uh, and then internationally. Uh, locally, we've done a lot of health and environmental studies proving the contamination a lot of public awareness about the impacts of this on human life. Uh, everything from skin disease to respiratory disease to, to uh, um, cardiovascular to uh, uh, bone disease to cancer uh, to neurological damage. Uh, a lot of public awareness. And then organizing um, for systemic change to enforce environmental regulations. And to start cleaning up the land itself, to actually do the uh, hands, hands on uh, dirty work of bioremediation using native plants to suck out some of the contaminants in the soil and restore nutrients to the soil. Nationally, uh, strengthening our solidarity with other communities uh, throughout Peru, among those other 4,000 mining liabilities, organizing with other communities to come together so that we can advocate for uh, better policy, better regulations and um, protections uh, for human health and, um, and care for the environment. And also then advocating against the efforts to uh, roll back environmental regulations. So there's an ongoing advocacy uh, um, ha happening here nationally. And, and then internationally, uh, addressing that those uh, stipulations in those trade agreements that allow for this billionaire to be able to sue the government of Peru uh, for hundreds of millions of dollars when he's the one who wasn't abiding by environmental regulations. That seemed odd to us. And so uh, uh, we began addressing that particular issue of trade agreements, not eliminating trade, but refining trade. Um, and then strengthening solidarity with communities impacted by mining including in the US, that town outside of St. Louis. And so there were exchange visits between folks from Herculaneum, Missouri and La Roya, Peru, visiting one another, also testifying in courts uh, in, in either place, speaking to the press in either place. And so that kind of solidarity really generated uh, a lot of energy and, and helped spur the movement along. Uh, so Nan, my wife and her young adult volunteer program, she, uh, the 20 something year olds who come down here, they are also involved. Uh, 
in uh, working with local youth and children, those who um, are most impacted, helping them tell their story. Uh, so it's not um, so that they feel that they are also a part of their own future. And uh, they've also been helping us a lot on researching um, mining activity, uh, uh, not only just in Peru, but in the U.S. as well, as we try to establish new connections with communities in the U.S. And then churches, uh, Presbyterian or not. Um, we've been doing solidarity. We invite uh, Presbyterians to come and for solidarity visits to La Roya and other affected areas to learn, uh, to walk alongside of folks here. Uh, also hosting visits from Peruvians to the U.S. Um, and then accompanying the local communities, such as in uh, Herculaneum, Missouri. So the work they're doing in Missouri is um, parallel to the work we're doing here, but that is a part of growing solidarity. Um, and then some more hands-on work uh, for those who are into that, supporting the local bioremediation work here in Peru, in, the, in La Roya. Um, they've done a lot in advocating for uh, refining these trade agreements so that the the rights of a billionaire don't outweigh the rights of a local population to breathe clean air. And now we're right in the middle of uh, a work of mapping out uh, uh, mining activity in the U.S. to identify uh, communities that are impacted by the same companies um, in the U.S. and in Peru um, to see if we can make more connections like we did between that community in Herculaneum and the one in La Roya. And there's also we're at the beginning of a campaign, this is particularly for uh, national level churches of divesting their money from mining companies that are really exploiting uh, peoples. Um, and we're at the early stages of that as well. So what has changed uh, over the last five years? We are beginning to see a greener landscape in La Roya thanks to our bioremediation and uh, reforestation work there. Um, the smelters in La Roya, Missouri, it was never our goal to shut them down, but it was a necessary step to, to take place. And so both smelters are not operating. Um, we've organized a national movement here in Peru of communities affected by mining activity. Um, and they have achieved actual leg leg legislation that was passed earlier this year uh, just for specialized health care uh, for those impacted by mining activity. Um, and so they're now at the work of designing that, uh, what that will actually look like. The legislation was passed. Um, and we've had some success in refining trade agreements, um, not the trade agreement between the US and Peru, but other trade agreements. Um, we've had been a part of helping uh, uh, the re, uh, renegotiating of trade agreements to address the issue. Um, and uh, a growing movement in the U.S. We are slowly connecting with churches and communities um, that are interested in, in that are impacted in the U.S. by mining activity. And um, somewhat related, we also, and this is very particular to the Presbyterian Church, we've created uh, the Presbyterian Tree Fund, uh, which is something of a carbon offset program um, that will help finance uh, projects like this particular one in, in La Roya. But I think that, and I'll end, I'm about to end here, our understanding the mission is what has changed more than anything. It is less about us going to solve people's problems, uh, it is very much about becoming in, going in solidarity so that we can help one another address our own problems. Recognizing that at the root of problems we face in the US and in Peru and other places of the world, um, the deepest, at the deepest level, we are interconnected. Um, and in this interconnected world, uh, which is pandemic has taught us just how interconnected we are. It behooves us to be in solidarity with one another. And I'll end, this is my last slide. Uh, and this is uh, the last group that visited us before the pandemic. Uh, we went up into the mountains outside of La Roya and we stumbled upon uh, what was a, um, a Incan ritual site, which even the folks there didn't know existed. Um, but as we're walking there, we stumble upon it. They recognize what it was and they ensured that we took a moment and we gave thanks. And they performed a ritual of giving uh, thanks to mother earth uh, and, and giving water uh, back to mother earth. Um, and I say all of this because at the heart, it, this is a spiritual issue. And when the church came here 500 years ago, it came to suppress a spirituality that was, all, that was already very present here. 
I think today, a lot of our work is not only helping uh, people live into and, and uncover that spirituality, but also uncover our own spirituality. When the church did come here, uh, it was not the fullness of our faith. It was not the complete understanding of the word of God. Um, it, uh, it lacked a lot. And so I believe in relationship with uh, peoples expressing indigenous spiritualities, we can un uh, further uncover our own spirituality, which is also, uh, there's very much a place of our, relate, uh, our in, in strengthening our relationship with the earth and living in harmony with one another. And so harmony, uh, balance, um, and relationship with our well-being as people is very much tied to our the well-being of the earth. I'm going to end right there. And if there are any questions, comments, critiques, I'm more than happy to respond to this. But I thank you so much for giving me this all this time to be able to share this story. Um, I could go on, but I'll stop right there. Thank you so much. If I could just get you to um, stop your screen. Oh, yeah. Sorry. There you go. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Um, and then I just wanted to, you know, open up the room because um, I, I think we have some questions. It was just so fascinating. And you really, really um, put a lot into a short period of time with a, a tremendous amount of history that was just so interesting. Um, I want there. Somebody is asking about the um, about the government and the election and the corruption, which I guess is yeah. trying to support the continuance of what's happening. I don't know if you have any further. Yeah. On that. So uh, we had a very contentious uh, election. Um, it's still unfolding right now. Um, Sunday was the voting here. Wednesday, they still haven't declared a winner. Um, and it the pandemic really is is was kind of the the tip uh, the 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 straw, uh, the final straw that kind of uh, exposed us to basically two, two extreme candidates, um, one from the far, far right, one from the far left. Um, both initially had really authoritarian perspectives on wanting to, one expressing the hard hand of the law and the other saying, going to keep powers once I get it. And so, uh, it's a crazy system here. There's a two round voting system. The first round was back in April and there was 20 candidates and you get the top two. And so these two extremist candidates are the two that passed to the second round. So 80% uh, of the population didn't want either one. Uh, at the end of the day, um, they had to choose one of the two. Um, and the guy on the extreme left, he kind of came back <laughs> to the center a little bit. Um, but the woman on the far right, she uh, is tied up in a whole lot of corruption scandals dating, dating back many, many years. Um, and and um, she's got several, she's been in jail three times already, and she's probably facing another 30 years in jail uh, for corruption charges. And so her main objective was really to get to become president, to avoid going to jail and to increase her wealth. <laughs> um, and she... Um, but she got half the population to follow her because she painted the other candidate as a communist and a terrorist uh, and it scared people. Um, so there's right now they've counted 99.95% of the vote and the guy on the left is ahead by like 60,000 votes. Um, he'll probably be the president, but the, the difference is he, all the votes he got were from the middle of the country, that that mining corridor, the, where the social conflicts are, where all the mining, all of those, where all the poverty is, they like over eighty percent of the population there voted for him, and then all the people in Lima, <laughs> where all the wealth is, and uh, along the coast, they all voted for the person on the right. So it was that uh, that collision uh, came head to head uh, in the election, and so we're playing that out in every aspect of life. Mm. Familiar. <laughs> Sounds familiar. Sue, yeah. um, if you could unmute yourself, go ahead. Sure. Jed, I, I want to thank you so much. I think it's fascinating how you've tied together the the spirituality, the history, you know, the 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 stories of faith all together in, in our health and wellness 
topics. I just think that it's terrific how you brought that all together. Um, you mentioned the doctrine of discovery, which I only learned about like this past week. And you might be aware um, the, the, the reason it was brought up in a webinar that I was watching recently, uh, this doctrine of discovery, which came out of the Catholic Church in the 1500s, right? Um, it is now being used by the indigenous people in this country to sort of expose the history and just to explain how, how long-term and how systemic this pattern is that we all sort of accept and are having to, to work against. Um, I think it's incredible that you're, that this group of Presbyterians and other churches are, you know, are working up against that. It's almost like an anti um, doctrine of discovery, you know, in now. Um, so anyway, I just want to thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, the doctrine of discovery, yeah, is very much, you know, uh, uh, give, paving the way for people to go and take land, you know, from indigenous peoples uh, around the world. Uh, and, and it's been used, right, in court cases in the U.S. to justify um, land claims uh, against indigenous peoples in the U.S. It, as recent as the early 2000s and um, in, in from the Supreme Court in the U.S. have uh, relied on the doctrine of discovery. Yeah, I, I think you might be aware of what's going on in Minnesota now with the pipeline and the indigenous right. there. And um, Fletcher Harper, I don't know, he's a, mm -hmm. uh, you know yep. Fletcher? Yep. He's, a, he's an Episcopalian uh, priest who, I just saw him on a YouTube and he's up there with the indigenous people and, you know, and just rallying the, rallying the groups to, to fight the pipeline. Right. So, do you have a sense that the work that you're doing is welcomed, um, welcomed obviously by the communities yeah. that you're in, but are, do you get pushback? Um, oh yeah, <laughs> we do, uh, and it, it comes in waves, and um, and yeah, you have to you learn when to when to stay low and <laughs> when to when to speak mm -hmm. out. But and so we're always kind of assessing the environment to figure out you know, what actions to take and when to take them. But yeah, there's definitely pushback from the company. Um, you know, the companies are from authorities. You know, police are often used uh, to defend the companies as opposed to protect the people. Um, and so um, our partners definitely here, you know, Peruvian partners definitely have faced serious risks. Um, I, I'm, you know, I've had some issues from time to time, but you know, right now I don't feel at risk, but um, it does come up from time to time. Yeah, it's. I must say that I bristled, to be honest, at um, a president who I liked um, praising the country for how well they were doing, um, seemingly without regard to the impact it was having. Um, and maybe that was just a short sighted, quick look I had, but that was my sense. Yeah, it's, I mean, the macro numbers, you know, uh, all do speak to develop, you know, economic growth, you know, okay. so on a macro level, yeah, Peru is doing really great, but it's just not, when you're taking a closer look, it, it's not equally distributed and there's real negative impact. It's not even just distribution of the wealth, it's, you know, the negative impact it, it creates to, to create that wealth, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and no, it's just not looked at. Um, you know, and I, I, I don't blame him. I wasn't yeah, trying to. No, I understand. <laughs> it's just hard to. I, I it boggles the mind. I, that's yeah. all. <laughs> um, uh, Bill, which countries have the greatest investment in the mining industry in Peru? So the United uh, States, China has a great interest in mining yeah. throughout the world at this right. point in time. Yeah, China uh, is the biggest, and they they want copper. Uh, the U.S. would be next, and they want gold. Um, and then you get some Canadian, uh, Australian, uh, European, you know, backed um, mining companies. Um, and there, there are other metals, but, you know, those are the, the biggies, or copper and gold right now. But China has, I think, the most investment overall, which is a whole other issue because I, we can't really, it's hard to address China. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Right. so um we we are out of time but i think i, I do want to address 
see, Joe is asking really, what would you recommend that congregations like ours offer your effort, you know, or, or just communities like ours, we've gathered, this is not just a congregation, but a community that has gathered and any recommendations for what would be? Um, one, uh, I think some things I, I feel like you, it sounds like you're already doing. Uh, one is, is following what's happening in, in the U.S. as well. And you've spoken to the, you know, the pipelines in Minnesota. Um, but other uh, extractive industry stuff, it may be, I don't know, in New Jersey, <laughs> but mm. certainly not too far away in Pennsylvania. Um, the, you know, the extractive industries throughout the U.S. as well. But we're just trying to create relationships and understanding of this industry that we are all very much dependent on it. And that's, I, I don't want to, it's very easy for me to stand here and critique the extractive industry when I look just in this little room I have and everything in here comes from that, the stuff that mm -hmm. we have, we're all dependent on it. So how can we just make it a better industry? Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, but connections um, and just uh, hearing our story, telling the story, uh, and if you want to come visit us, we very much welcome that. Uh, and likewise, if we were to come to the U.S., if you wanted to welcome me or our partners, just to continue telling the story and learning the story, I think that's the place to be in mm. um, before we can to decide on a particular action to take. Well, thank you. Um, we'll end on that note. Friends, I put in the chat um, Jed's contact information, and he suggested that's the best way to learn more about the, um, the work that he's doing and in ways in which we can um, to interface with it. Um, thank you very much for being with us this evening. Uh, and as we go from this space, um, our Zoom room, I we, we bid you a well uh, week and that we will be completing our, our series tonight and we'll be back again in September for more Wellness Wednesdays. Uh, as life continues to open up, we, um, we know that we will still continue to want to gather um, to learn the many things that we're learning. So thanks again from, uh, for, from us. We really offer you gratitude for, for spending time with us this evening and uh, really fantastic, fantastic programs.